So hello, everybody. Um, thanks for being here this afternoon. I hope this is um, working. I think so, yes, OK. So um, this afternoon on Worldwide Neuro, hosted by the Tübingen Neuro Campus, we have with us uh, Stephanie Palmer from the University of Chicago. And um, I'm really glad uh, she made it over here. Um, <laughs> at least for this uh, afternoon morning um, talk. Um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. Um, I saw you last time, I think, in, um, in Lisbon one and a half okay. years ago or so in, in our workshop on um, uh, retinal computations. And um, I remember you gave a beautiful talk about butterflies. Um, so let's see what you have uh, up for us this afternoon. There were, I promise there will be a little bit more butterfly today with some more uh, details. So thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'm very excited to share with you some of our recent results. Is that all working and looking good? Yeah, this is looking good. Um, it says sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. Can you see my window? OK, you can see my slides. Yes. Good. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about retinal computation. Um, the work that I'm going to show you today comes from a variety of different people. Jared Salisbury was uh, the very first grad student in my group and has uh, graduated and is on the market for postdocs, so you should uh, snap up Jared. Some of the data that Jared collected was in collaboration with Olivier Marr, who runs a wonderful group at the Vision Institute in Paris, and you should check out what they're doing. Audrey Cederberg was the first postdoc in the group, and I'll show you um, some results from one of her papers. She's um, now at Emory, but on her way to a faculty position soon. Siwei Wang is a postdoc, current postdoc in the group at UChicago, and Nathan Berkeley just graduated from the group and is now in Jamie Jeannie's lab at Yale as a Schwartz Fellow. So diving right into it, um, we have some funding sources I need to thank. I'll get that out of the way. Um, we are really grateful for the wide variety of projects that we work on and that people are willing to um, support that and let us explore this wide range of questions you can ask in neuroscience. A few um, plugs for things you can check out later online. Um, if you are interested in fixed camera motion movies, we have what we call the Chicago Motion Database and using Glo Globus, you can download, uh, select what kind of movies you want and download them um, online at this uh, URL. And also um, in neuroscience, we know that biology is a quantitative discipline, but all fields of biology have become quantitative. And Stefano Alessina, Vicky Prince and I developed this one week kind of boot camp for quantitative methods in biology. And if you're new to this sort of thing and you would like to learn more, then you can check out some of these um, materials online at Stefano's GitHub page. Um, and this includes some pedagogy about how to do rigorous and reproducible work with biological data, and also has um, problems and solutions using real data from uh, mostly from the UChicago faculty. I wanna start out my uh, talk um, this entire year by acknowledging um, uh, a woman who helped shape my career. Um, this is Mary Jane Morrison. She was um, an inspiration to me. She got her Bachelor of uh, Science in Physics at the University of Chicago, um, I will say back in the day. Uh, she graduated in 1941 and went on to work on radar during the war um, as part of the uh, women who were accepted for volunteer emergencies service during um, World War II into the Navy. Uh, Mary Jane was a fascinating pioneering um, uh, woman in physics and I was, I'm really proud to um, have been um, her uh, granddaughter and also um, that the University of Chicago always um, accepted uh, women uh, into various programs and did not sort of exclude women from doing uh, fields like physics even um, when there weren't very many at all women doing that. So I wanted to give a shout out to um, my grandma, Mary Jane, uh, because she inspired me and because this year would have been her 100th uh, birthday. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today, 
is this notion um, that physicists have about the brain and that it might be optimal. It might be optimized to do uh, maximal information processing. Um, and what's really important about this mm -hmm. concept Oh, excuse Sorry, me. Yeah. There has been a question. Have you hit any slide progressing thing yet? I have. Okay. Are we not <clears throat> progressing slides? No. Okay, let me jump out. So we have to fix that first. Yes, we do. Let me let me fix that. I am going to quit keynote and then I'm going to start it again. I think what happened is that I tested it and it has a bit of a issue. So there's to begin. Okay, so you only saw my title slide, is that correct? Yes. Shoot. All right, well, we can fix that. We can fix that. That's okay. Now it should work. There, can you see my next slide? Yes. Okay, so let's remember everything I said. Um, I'm Stephanie. These are some wonderful people who contributed to the talk today. You were able to see that. Um, we have funding sources and we thank them. Uh, we have a natural motion database if you would like to download things. Uh, we have a quantitative methods in biology boot camp uh, that we run at the University of Chicago. And this is the GitHub link um, through my co-director, Stefano Alessina. Um, we did the first five years together and now uh, Steph Stefano and John November are doing this uh, along with Vicky Prince. Um, so you can get the materials there from Stefano's uh, GitHub site. Um, and that's a useful resource. This is my grandma, who was a early physicist at the University of Chicago. And uh, her picture is actually there on my wall. It's nice that you're here in my office with me today. Um, and what I'm gonna talk to you about today is optimal coding in the brain. Uh, Philip, are we all set now? Yes, much better. Okay, good. Okay, so this is all working. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear it. Apologies for the technical hiccup. So uh, what I was saying is that physicists sort of flood into neuroscience because it's such a wonderful playground of ideas and concepts. And we really have, uh, at least from my perspective, from coming from condensed matter theory, we have we have sort of question envy that you can ask in neuroscience this wonderfully deep. Um, questions about sort of your everyday experience. And uh, so physicists have flooded into neuroscience and we like to be able to apply our mathematical models and tools to questions in the brain. So we like to think about optimal coding. And I'd say some of the early work in visual neuroscience um, showed that there are ways in which early, the early visual system is optimized for information transmission. There's pioneering work from Simon Laughlin that we can point to. Everybody's familiar with Barlow's theories about efficient coding with the caveats that come later about that might not be the end of the story. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is how we make this idea of optimality more nuanced because we don't wanna all have to be as clever as um, say Simon Laughlin, uh, Rob de Reuter, uh, Bill Bialik, and find the perfect system to look at to explore a question of optimal coding in the brain. And biology gets nuanced and, and messy when we step away from those places where the front end transducer has been pushed over evolutionary time by natural selection to do the job that we think a kind of optimal physical device would do. We might not always be pushed to the physical limits. There might be other constraints that the system is solving. And people um, in that list that I gave, Laughlin, Reuter, Barlow, Bialik, have all thought about how to do the next steps um, as well as doing the first steps. And I'm gonna talk to you about some of that today. So what are these other constraints we need to add in when we take ourselves seriously as biologists and look closely at the biology? Well, we have to think about the behavioral goals of the organism. As Land taught us, there is no best eye. There's just a, a better or worse eye for affecting that animal's behavioral goals that let it uh, succeed and outcompete, say, its uh, neighbors. We also have to think about the fact that nervous systems are, don't bubble up out of the primordial soup de novo. They evolve. And this is a hard question to wrap your head around theoretically. And I'm gonna to talk to you in the second half of this talk um, about butterflies and about how we've tried to take the question of how you see how ancestry shapes your computation, um, how we do try to take that seriously and make some first steps. 
So we're going to start, though, with um, how behavioral goals influence um, what and how you process your early visual uh, information. And here in my group, we have started with the behavioral goal of making a prediction. And the reason we think about prediction as an important behavioral goal is that um, neurons are laggy uh, circuit elements. And those intrinsic lags that are present in every uh, synapse mean that if you want to make a fast and accurate interaction with your outside world, you have to be able to bridge those sensory transduction gaps and those sensory motor transduction gaps. So we think that prediction is a goal of at least part of visual processing. And I wanna show you that your brain makes predictions. So um, today I'm gonna to use Philip as my test subject. And what I want everybody to do is look at the center part of the screen. And this bar is gonna start moving. And then there's gonna be another bar that flashes. And I want you to decide while keeping your eyes fixed here, whether or not the flashed bar is ahead collinear or behind this sweeping bar. So I'll go ahead and start it. Okay, and we're gonna assume that Philip is our representative human. Was the flash bar ahead, behind, or collinear with the sweeping bar? I would say it was a little bit behind. A little bit behind. Okay, let's yeah. try this again. It's gonna move faster this time. Again, fix your eyes here. And let's see what you see. It was uh, further behind, I would say. Further behind. Um, some people, yes, that's, that's what the majority of people see. Some people might also see that the bar looks bent. When you actually look at the, at the same exact movie slowed down and you let your eyes wander around, hopefully what you can see is that the flash is actually perfectly collinear with the sweeping bar. This is an example of what's called the flash lag illusion, and it happens in many modalities. And what your brain is doing is it's, it's extrapolating from this predictable sweeping bar forward in time. So it's actually prospecting the sweeping bar forward so that when the flashed unexpected bar comes on, you see it as lagging behind. And it's evidence of some of both the sensory lags you have in your visual system and the fact that your early visual system is compensating for it for you. So you're not seeing the veridical picture. You're seeing what your brain is sort of extrapolating forward for you. Um, and so there's evidence that this starts as early as the retina. And so what we ask then is how do we write down an equation that will let us quantify how much prediction the retina is doing for you? So we want to add a computational goal to optimal coding. So we think not just about taking, say, this cartoon of a visual signal and compressing it into the spikes and silence we see in a population in the retina so that we, lose, so that we keep as much information as possible. Of course, we want to keep information about the visual scene. Um, but early ideas about, about optimal coding only thought about sort of this step, just given how many neurons I have and maybe some metabolic constraints. How much information can I retain about this? What we have here is kind of this bottleneck where we wanna, we wanna, we have only so much information we can, we can, we can keep, so we're shrinking, but we want to maintain as much information as we can about the future. We've defined a relevant variable. That relevant variable is uh, the part that lets us make predictions. So technically speaking, we're gonna be solving a Lagrangian where we're minimizing the information about the past subject to constraining ourselves to maintain a certain amount of information about the future as parameterized by beta. And here S is the stimulus, stimulus in the past, stimulus in the future, could be a vector across the features of the stimulus and across time. Um, and this W is the word, the binary response of the retina at time T. So what we can do as a sort of quantitatively minded neuroscientist is solve this equation for some dream fantasy optimal uh, W. And then we can compare it to what the retina really does. And we can say, okay, this is what the retina would be doing if its representation were optimized for prediction. And this is what we see. And when those two things match up, 
we develop some evidence and confidence that our idea that prediction is sort of a goal uh, that's, that's implemented in the retina is, is playing out. So our, our decision to put the relevant information being the future here is our kind of instantiation of the behavior, what we guess at as the behavioral goals of the system. So just to remind ourselves, we're looking at recordings from the retina. So where's the retina? The retina is the tissue at the back of your eye. Um, it's, the, it's your light sensor and computational structure inside your eye. It's part of your central brain that happens to be sitting out in your eyeball. If we take a slice through the retina, we see that it's a very beautifully com complex piece of the brain. Uh, this is a lovely diagram from Vesla's uh, review. And here we see the photoreceptor layer, we see um, horizontal cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, and finally the ganglion cells, the output cells of the retina whose axons form your optic nerve. Now, this is a much reduced picture of the wiring diagram of, of the retina, and it's already complicated. Already by parsimony, as biologists, we would say, you would not build this kind of complex cellular structure just to com co convey a kind of camera-like pixel by pixel, photoreceptor by photoreceptor image of what these cells are seeing. These other cells, the guts of the retina are there to make a computation. And we've seen over and over and over again um, that the retina does quite a bit of computation. Here we're gonna be focusing on what salamander and rat, rat retinas do to support this problem of prediction. So here's a larval tiger salamander, they're aquatic. And what we can do is record from the retina of this animal um, while we were projecting a visual scene onto the photoreceptor layer. So here's, a, here's an image of a retina that's been stained so that you can see the output cells and their axons. You can see the retinal ganglion cells and their axons and also the recording device. So you take the retina out of the animal, it's still alive, you squish it onto a glass slide in which you've embedded recording electrodes and when the density of those recording electrodes here matches the density of the retinal ganglion cells here, you have a chance at seeing what the brain sees in this part of the visual field. Now, these big streaks are the bundles of axons that are streaming towards this animal's optic nerve. Okay, so when we have a good recording, we can get a complete population um, sort of view of what, uh, of what uh, the salamander retina sees. And what we want to do now is to present to the retina a bar stimulus, a simple stimulus, but that has both predictable and non-predictable motion components. So here is that bar stimulus. And you can see this black bar jiggling around um, the center of the screen. And it has both a predictable component. You sort of know that it's going to stay around center. It has a little bit of inertia, so it keeps going in the same uh, direction when it gets a kick, but it's also sort of jittering. And that's because it's receiving random velocity kicks. So this is the velocity of the bar. So this is dv dt the acceleration. Here's a velocity, there's some drag. Here is the restoring force. This omega naught is like a fictive spring that's tethering the bar to the center of the screen. And here is our diffusion constant and this is the um, white noise random velocity kicks that the bar is getting. So that's the prior position of the bar. It's centered around the center of the screen where we've sort of squished the retina down onto it. Um, these components of the motion make this predictable. This is just a damp harmonic oscillator. This part is unpredictable. That's what makes it more like Brownian motion plus uh, this restoring force. So, there is both a predictable and a non-predictable component to the motion. And what we're asking is, does the retina, when it compresses that down, it has to throw some information away, it can't keep everything. Does it preferentially keep, say, this predictable part at the cost of the non-predictable part? So to do that, we can solve this equation that I showed you before, which is called an information bottleneck equation, which was pioneered by Tali Tishby, uh, Bill Bialik, and colleague colleagues, along with Ilya Nemanin, um, and uh, Gal Chetik actually solved this for the particular kind of motion we're looking at here, which is where the um, uh, sort of input you have and the relevant variable are jointly Gaussian. You can solve this exactly. So we can, on the same plot, put the information you have about the future, the information you have about the past. There's a forbidden region where you can't have any information, 
And this is the bound that we calculate this fantasy optimal retina would sit right along this bound. So for every amount of compression, it would have this much to say about the future. What we wanna do is then go measure what the real retina does. So we're gonna put the real retina on this slide. The real retina gives us access to this region because we can only record from so many cells. We can only do um, this hard measurement in small populations. So we're gonna zoom in here. And again, this is the information that the retina has about the future and the information that the retina has about the past. Here's that bound. And this is what the retina does for small groups of cells of size one cell up to seven cells. And what you see is that the retina fairly well hugs this bound. Now, when a point is up here, it's because we have errors in our information estimation, not because it's sort of um, become a magical neuron and violated the laws of causality. Um, so don't, don't fret too much about that. And these error bars show you both sort of across different groups of cells, how much variation we have, plus how much um, uh, sort of precision do we have in these information measurements, which get a little bit more flaky as we go to larger and larger groups of cells. So how surprised should you be at this result? If we go back to our textbook picture of what retinal ganglion cells do, meaning they have center surround receptive fields with an output nonlinearity, an LNP model, linear nonlinear Poisson model of the retina, turns out that that model fit to these particular cells does not saturate the bound. It actually looks like it's saturating a bound with about a hundred millisecond lag, a different bound, one that's not doing prediction of the, of the real future, but of the future, you know, sort of 100 milliseconds from now. So it does a good job, but it does not hit this bound, whereas the real data from the retina do. And work in the group now is asking what sort of elements do we have to add to the LNP model to get it to do this? One thing that Jared was able to show really nicely is that if you, if you um, let the retina have a combination of position and velocity filters, not just the simple uh, sort of spatial filter that you get from say a uh, white noise estimate of the receptive field of the cell, then you can, you, can, you can approach this bound. That's something I won't have time to tell you about today, but we are interested in exactly what mechanistically you need to add to um, reveal this functioning of the retina. What Jared was able to do was to head off to Paris um, during the time he was a PhD student in my group and record from the rat retina, from very large dense arrays that Olivier Marr developed um, when he was in the Berry lab and then took with him to his own group um, in Paris. And what these let you do is have a big field um, in the retina um, with, again, the same very high density. And, and in their group, they can record from a variety of animals like rats and salamanders, um, amongst other things like mice. And what Jared wanted to do was he wanted to explore the space of this class of motion. So we set some parameters, omega naught, tau, and the diffusion constant here. And those parameters tell you basically what the structure of your best predictor should be. So what Jared wanted to do was to explore different bar movies with different kind of damping coefficients and, and noise and things like that. What Vedant Sachdeva, who's a current graduate student in my group did, was um, take this uh, question very seriously and explored the entire space of uh, possible um, input parameters and what your optimal predictive filter should look like as a combination, like what combination of position and velocity information should it retain to be the best predictor? And it turns out that changes depending on how far in the future you're trying to predict and what the combination of parameters is. Vedant also uh, made more complicated noise models with correlations and also tied this to um, Wright-Fisher dynamics, which are important in, if you're thinking about um, viral evolution and the immune system. So this paper is fun to check out if you'd like to know more about the math nitty gritty about how we solve these info bottleneck problems for a wide range of input statistics. What Jared did was take two different kinds of input statistics, one that was kind of uh, critically damped and one that was underdamped. So you can see this one, a stimulus one, is kind of jittering around, and the other one is sort of more um, uh, smoothly oscillating back and forth. He showed these same movies to the same rat retina and was able to do the same sort of uh, procedure we talked about before with the information bottleneck technique and show 
that again, we could compute this bound analytically for these uh, movies and then ask for these same neurons from the same retina, um, do they saturate the bound or not? And what's interesting is that they saturated the bound for the uh, oscillating back and forth movie, but they did not saturate the bound for this movie, which was closer to what the salamander retina uh, responded to was shown. And the salamander retina saturated the bound for this kind of motion, whereas the rat retina seems to saturate the bound for this kind of motion. This kind of motion requires more velocity filtering. You have to add some velocity information into your current position estimate, whereas this is more of a, how much do you know about where you are right now and where you will be in the, and extrapolating from that where you will be in the future. So Jared was able to show quite nicely that the retina in both cases responded quite a bit to this movie, had a lot of information about the past, but didn't have the same kind of information about the future. And we would like to be able to say something more detailed about whether or not this aligns with the kind of motion a rat would see in its natural ecological niche versus a salamander. We know things about their behavior. We know that salamanders are sit and wait predators. So position information might be really important to them. Their retina might function differently. We know that rats are constantly on the lookout for predators and they're moving through their environment quite quickly. So we can make just so stories about, the, about why you might have more uh, velocity encoding in the rodent retina than we saw before and why you might be better suited to doing prediction when uh, velocity information is the component that lets you do a good job of prediction in your, in your input statistics. But we really need to do more work to say that definitively. So I kind of leave it, leave it with you there to think about. What Jared was able to show was that as a function of uh, time from uh, sort of veridical future, so this is where the spikes are happening, and this is the future. Um, this is how much information uh, the retina had about position at time t. And so the retina had a lagged information, um, more information in the past about position. I'm not showing you velocity, which will change this, which changes this picture a bit and pushes things closer to uh, the future. But there was a significant change in the delay in stimulus one versus stimulus two. So the retina had a shift in its sort of peak. So the lag was apparently like 100 milliseconds here and more like 70 milliseconds here. And that was a big shift that was um, quite significant. And these are the same neurons. And what we have been able to show, what Jared has been able to show, is that simply by having um, a particular position velocity filter that's affected by, that's sort of implemented by your um, uh, whole retinal processing that's leading into your ganglion cell, you can get this kind of behavior. You can get a shift forward in time that compensates for lags when you have this kind of input statistics. So what we want to do is to match up that kind of behavioral repertoire with your computational um, uh, repertoire in the retina more, more tightly. And that's current work in the group. So stay tuned for more from uh, Jared and in collaboration with Olivia and Mar on that. But what I wanna do now is um, ask the question that I think all neuroscientists should ask when somebody says, I've computed that the retina or whatever peripheral brain area uh, has um, about the external world. If somebody says we have four bits of information about olfactory cues or the visual system or the auditory system, you should ask yourself as a good sort of critical scientist, that's great, but you, you measured that with your fancy math and your fancy um, uh, computational techniques in, in Python or C or whatever you like to use. And the question you should be asking is, that's all well and good. You could see something there in the data and that's suggestive but can this information be used by the brain? Can the brain pull that out? And that's something that Audrey Cedarberg worked on when she was a postdoc in our group in collaboration with Jason McLean. And what she was able to show is that downstream of the retina, a putative um, cell that's pooling information from retinal ganglion cells could actually retain almost all of the predictive information present in its inputs simply by using spike timing dependent plasticity. 
So by using a well-known local rule for wiring up its connections from its input retinal cells, this putative downstream neuron could maintain almost all of the predictive information that was present in its inputs. So we were able to show that not only is there predictive information coming from the retina in groups of cells, it could easily be extracted using biologically plausible, plausible simple local rules. Audrey was further able to show that that let the downstream neuron have uh, stimulus information far into the future, even though it was just doing a calculation about its inputs locally in time. And that's because of the correlation structure in the outside world, in the stimuli that impinge in our visual systems and coordinated with how the retina encodes it and that it can be extracted so easily by local, temporally local downstream rules. So if you'd like to know more, there's a paper on that. I'm sort of whizzing through some um, recent uh, results we have from the group so I can talk to you about some unpublished, as yet unpublished work that we're very excited about in butterflies. So this is saying um, a first step towards saying downstream of the retina, you could actually use this predictive information. Um, what about actual behavior? I've sort of said, um, trust me that prediction is important in the brain. Look, your brain does it. So your visual system is already helping you do prediction. But we want to tie that all the way soup to nuts from the input to the output. So Siwei Wang in the group has thought about whether or not prediction can be uh, an important cue in a real uh, sort of mission critical behavior. Um, and this is just a highlight of what Seaway did, and you can check it out on BioArchive. We just posted an update to this paper that um, clarifies uh, how we set up the problem and um, adds some new exciting results that Seaway was able to calculate in this last year. The idea is to look at the invasive flight maneuvers of flies, of dipterans. Of, um, here I'm showing you a blowfly. Uh, we have exquisite behavioral data that's um, publicly available from the Dickinson group. And what happens, uh, in these flies is that they're flying along, they sense a visual threat, and they very quickly have to reorient themselves to fly away from that, away from that threat. So there's a visual signal, there's a delay in processing that, and then the fly is about to make a huge change to its flight program. And then over just a tiny amount of time, over 40 milliseconds, it's gonna make a banked, and counterbank turn to orient, cell, orient its uh, direction of flight away from the threat. Seaway's hypothesis um, was that the visual information that comes from that initial estimate of where the threat was combined with the fly's position in 3D space, it has to know where it is to know how it should move its body, and then its very initial turn, it's gonna start this turn, it then has made such a massive change to its flight plan. It's got a little bit of a gap. It's got like a 20 millisecond gap where it, it doesn't have gyroscopic control from the halteers yet. It definitely doesn't have visual feedback, which takes a while. So her hypothesis is that the visual prediction from the vertical sensing system of the fly might help guide active flight con control during this time. Because remember, Flight is aerodynamically unstable. And if you don't control it really, really well, you fall out of the sky. So during this first banked and then leading into the counterbank turn, um, what uh, Seaway put forward and what we worked out in this paper was how much visual prediction from just that initiation of the escape response could um, help control flight. And that's also an information bottleneck problem. Okay. so. We're starting to dig into real behavior. We're starting to dig into downstream processing. We're starting to ask about sort of your ecological niche and how that sculpts your early visual system. Can we get at the super thorny question of, can we ask something about how neural systems evolve and how that impacts early vision? So I'm gonna take a second and tell you about how we set this problem up conceptually and what our sort of pie in the sky goals are for future work. So what we wanna ask here is whether or not we can understand what and how your brain computes at sort of the extant species we see and how that's, um, how that's been sculpted over evolutionary time. So we wanna know and have some theory of how neural computations evolve. 
how you add a computation to a system, how you elaborate a computation in a system, whether or not the fact that you evolve, that you don't get to do things de novo, like you don't get to bubble up from the primordial soup, no one gets out the Legos and builds you. Um, you, have to, you have to be sort of a, a, a kind of, you know, prime on what came before. Given that fact, does that sculpt the set of things that a brain can compute? Does the fact of your history narrow the window you can um, look out to for future calculations? Or um, does it say how you're going to do that? Now that's a really big question uh, because of course the, the fact of evolution is a constraint that comes alongside your behavioral goal and your metabolic constraints and the sort of size constraints of how many neurons do you have in this area? So what we wanted to do to make a first pass at this was try to find a system where you could peel away all the other constraints and be left with something that's just about your ancestry. And then we wanna look and see whether or not you can detect shadows of your ancestral history in the way that you compute now. So to do that, um, Nathan Berkeley and my group, um, who I like to say is the bravest graduate student ever because he joined a theoretical group and did an experimental project on butterflies, um, also did a computational project um, with us where he asked how you add a new photoreceptor into your color vision repertoire. So this was inspired by work that Nathan started off doing on Heliconius butterflies in collaboration with Marcus Kronforst group here in ecology and evolution at the University of Chicago. What we've been thinking about alongside uh, the Kronforst group is how mate selection preference coexists um, with um, color pattern elaboration in Heliconius butterflies and how this signals and leads to speciation events. So how you go from having, um, say, the Sydno aletheia species that has two morphs, a white and yellow uh, wing morph, to speciating into two distinct species, Pachinus um, here and Galanthus, that, that are, are separate and have complete reproductive isolation. These guys already do some amount of assortative mating. So the white aletheia, prefer to mate with um, uh, white aletheia and yellow prefer to mate with yellow, modulo some caveats about the fact of whether or not they're homozygous or heterozygous, heterozygotes. Um, but so these bugs are actually starting their way towards speciation. So Nathan was working on measuring um, the uh, input visual system in these butterflies. And it got him thinking about color vision writ large and butterflies in particular. And a neat thing that butterflies do is that they have many, many times over evolutionary history added in a fourth color channel to their, to their visual repertoire. It's actually quite a lot of uh, uh, the, the photoreceptor complement in uh, moths and butterflies is quite labile. So the idea here um, in the field is that the ancestral insect was something moth-like that had UV blue and green photoreceptors. And over and over and over again, uh, modern butterflies have added in a long wavelength red channel. So they've gone from a trichromatic ancestor to a tetrachromatic um, uh, species. And this has happened many times in distinct lineages. So there are lots of tetrachromats interspersed with trichromats and we think the ancestral st state is trichromatic. There's lots of beautiful work, particularly from the Arikawa lab, from um, Adriana Briscoe's lab um, that shows both uh, how the front end visual systems of different butterflies look and operate and how they might have evolved um, this new uh, red color channel or how they might have split their UV. They do a lot of things. What we wanted to do was to pare this down to its uh, basic um, components and say, can we make a computational study of how going from trichromatic to tetrachromatic um, evolves and whether or not you would you would see shadows of your trichromatic past in how you do your current tetrachromatic computation. So here's the setup. What we want to think about is color opponency. So to do good color vision, you have to compare uh, your input photoreceptor channels. So here I'm doing something human-like. Here's blue uh, 
uh, green and red photoreceptors, colloquially speaking. Um, and humans, we do a red-green comparison and a blue comparison to a combo of red-green, so like a blue-yellow comparison. And you have to be able to compare that because you need to know um, uh, the difference between something being bright and something being a different hue. So to disambiguate hue from, from brightness, you have to make comparisons amongst your photoreceptors. And you need to make comparisons amongst all your pairs. So if you have three photoreceptors, you need two opponent channels at, at minimum. And most animals sort of satisfy the minimum and that's it. Um, if you have uh, trichromatic color opponent channels and you're doing UV blue green, you might have the same kind of setup. And your tetrachromatic uh, progeny uh, might just take these exact opponent channels and then add on a new one. That works just fine or they might re-sculpt um, the initial channels completely. There are lots and lots and lots of different ways to uh, set up, say, uh, uh, your color opponent channels that will work just as well. So here there is no, um, the previous theory and modeling work says that there really isn't a better or worse color opponent setup. You just have to do the comparisons. So here there is no kind of like, optimal solution, they're all kind of on the same playing field. And this is why we think the lever of evolutionary history is going to be detectable here. Because if you want to make this new color channel reasonable, you have to add it into your color opponent repertoire. But the way that you do that is really kind of up to you. You don't have to have a lot of neurons to do it. You don't have to send a lot of spikes or voltage signals to do it. And it doesn't matter how you do it, you just have to get it done. So here's a scenario where color vision is super important. Color vision evolved um, new color channels many, many times in evolutionary history. So we have a lot of extant species to look at. But the only thing that really might sculpt how you do it is the fact of where you came from last, who your trichromatic chromatic ancestor was. So that's what we want to look at. And we did this computationally. It's kind of a machine learning project. So here's our hypothesis. Um, trichromatic networks can evolve tetrachromatic vision, meaning a trichromatic network that does color opponency can expand to have a new color channel. It shouldn't be that hard, but it's not automatic. Not all trichromatic uh, ancestors are going to be as good at creating a tetrachromat um, offspring. And this, that's this hypothesis too, that the trichromatic network restricts the available state space for tetrachromatic computation. Meaning you could have a really good tetrachromatic ancestor that's very flexible and can give off uh, very quickly in just a few modifications, a good tetrachromat um, uh, progeny. Uh, but, we should, but we should also be able to see how its initial computation um, is reflected in the in the new tetrachromatic computation. So what we do here is we make a neural network with a four unit input layer, a 30 unit hidden layer, and a 34 unit output layer. So this is super simple. This is uh, for people who do what I would call like hardcore machine learning. This is not anything fancy or difficult, but the reason that it's useful is that we can interpret um, how it does this computation. And we don't think that real brains have to do much more than this. So we have four, a four unit input layer. We've changed all these numbers. Nothing really changes that much. So we're starting with something that looks like the ancestral insect, the trichromatic UV blue green. Um, that gets trained so that it can do single wavelength discrimination. So that if we send in 450 nanometers, its job is to give us a code on the output that gives us um, a nice peak around that um, channel. So it should make the output unit that peaks at 450 fire the most and fall off around it. So there should be some tuning curve in this output layer. You could also think of this as a kind of one hot representation that if I put in 450, I better get the output unit that represents 450 to be on. So then we trained a tetrachromatic network in the same system. So we said, okay, we have UV blue, green, and red. It has uh, connections that we have to learn onto the hidden layer, connections that we have to learn onto the output layer. And its goal is to map monochromatic light to the right output function. Um, and if we do that, so here are, say, our target um, 
output functions. And here are the in dash lines are what this unit produces at these points. Um, and the mean squared error between our target output and our affected output by the network is here. And this matches the humps and bumps and limits that you see in behavioral data from butterflies as well. Meaning this kind of copies the Fisher information curve that you'd get from the same kind of network. The more details in the bioarchive paper if you'd like to know more. Okay, so a tetrachromatic network can work. A trichromatic network can work trained in the same way. We get good discrimination in the trichromatic region. We don't do so well in the red here because we don't have that red photoreceptor. So the trichromatic network does a very good job here. It actually does a little bit better at single wavelength discrimination than the tetrachromatic network. So we've got the basis here. We can make, we can train trichromatic networks. We can train tetrachromatic networks. Now we want to evolve a tetrachromatic network from a trichromatic network. So we're going to compare evolved networks to what we call de novo networks. These tetrachromatic networks that, like I said, bubble up from the primordial soup. They don't have an ancestor. They just get to start from fresh, start fresh, start from scratch. So what we do is we take a trichromatic network and we mutate one of our green photoreceptors and make it red. Um, now that's a reasonable thing to do because you can show that when you, when you start to sort of march a green photoreceptor away, it's at first gonna screw up a little bit your trichromatic computation. But in just a few um, changes, just a few sort of what we're calling uh, uh, generations in our training algorithm, you can get back good trichromatic vision. So mutating one of your greens doesn't really screw up your trichromatic vision. But what you want to do is make it useful. You want to make it a good sort of tetrachromatic visual system. So what was thought is that you, you have successions of mutations that move your peak um, photoreceptor uh, sensitivity of, of, say, a duplicated green photoreceptor away from the green and towards a longer wavelength uh, peak. And then you rewire your brain to give you a really good tetrachromatic um, vision system. So what we do is we take a particular trichromatic ancestor and we mutate it. And what happens first is that if we have not retrained the trichromatic network, so here in blue is tri and uh, black is our de novo, our sort of primordial soup tetrachromatic network, um, we can see that when we first mutate it in red, it's kind of a little bit screwed up. But just a few um, iterations later, 10 training ep epochs later, it's already kind of gotten trichromatic recovered. And just with a few more training epochs, it can have good tetrachromatic vision. What's really fun about this is that the evolved networks um, do better than the de novo uh, networks for the same number of training epochs. So actually marching your computation from trichromatic to tetrachromatic does a good thing for you. What we next did was we did this many, many times for many different putative um, ancestors. So we had a particular trichromatic network that gave rise to say 100 different downstream tetrachromatic networks. So we did this training 100 different times. Then we did it on 100 different trichromatic networks. So we had a bunch of different putative trichromatic ancestors and we looked at a lot of their progeny. And our question here was, does the way that these things do tetrachromatic computation reflect their ancestry, or does it just reflect the fact that they do tetrachromatic computation? So we asked um, over and over and over again, what does um, the sort of weights of the units from the photoreceptor layer onto the hidden layer look like? And because these networks are small, we can really piece this apart and, and look at it. So we did this many times and we did PCA on these weights. And what we're trying to find out is what kind of color opponent channels do um, these evolved tetrachromatic networks do? And remember I said before that there is no sort of best tetrachromatic color opponent C. They're all kind of equally good. So it doesn't matter how you do it. And what we're hoping is that we would see that your ancestry sculpts the shape of that um, computation. And that's exactly what we saw. We did PCA on the hidden unit for an evolved, a set of evolved networks that had the same trichromatic ancestor. And without aligning or trying to rearrange any of these piece, principal components, we found that the, they all like sort of matched each other very well. 
So we had a UV minus green, UV minus blue channel. We had a blue minus green and we had a green minus red, loosely speaking, as our three um, color opponent channels for this particular set of tetrachromatic networks that all had the same um, trichromatic starting point. Now, if we just look at the tetrachromatic networks that bubble up from the primordial soup and we take a hundred of them, they do not have the same sort of um, common structure. They're kind of all over the map. They do their own thing. There's a little bit of residual structure that comes from the fact that you have to do uh, tetrachromatic computation, that there are you know, only so many ways that, that you can do that. So they're gonna have some amount of overlap, but really you can detect your trichromatic history in the way that you project onto this um, hidden unit layer. So that was a, a fun story. Um, there are lots more details. I will share some more of that next week at the Bernstein uh, meeting uh, satellite workshops, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, and you can see more in our paper online. Um, and so with that, I think um, I'm a little over for technical difficulties, but I'm gonna thank you and take some questions. I know I gave you a lot to think about, so I'll wait a few minutes and let you generate some questions. Thanks. Uh, All right, uh, Stephanie, thanks a lot for the talk. I'm uh, cheering for everybody in the audience. Thank you. Um, so I think there are already um, some questions. So Felix Schneider is asking um, whether Kalman filtering could be a useful concept to investigate um, trade-offs between future and past info or a that's a wonder framework. Yes, that's a wonderful question. So maybe I'll stop sharing for a second so I can just um, be with you. All right, let me come back here. Okay, now I can see myself. So yes, absolutely. Um, Kalman filtering is a thing uh, that you absolutely want to think about um, when, if you want to think about mechanism and how much the brain knows about kind of the external, the external world and the parameters it needs to um, implement in how it represents its ongoing sort of filter on the world. So in Vedant's such Davis paper that's on BioArchive, we actually do make the computation of the Kalman filter version of the problem. And the difference between the Kalman filter and the info bottleneck is all about efficiency. It's all about if I have to have only so much information about the past, what's the best way to um, represent the future? Kalman filtering doesn't have quite the same constraint structure so what we find is that while you can get the same uh, predictive information from both setups, what our information bottleneck structure tells you is how to do it most efficiently. So for the same amount of um, information about the past, you can get more from this predictive info setup from the info bottleneck setup than you can from a, a plain vanilla common filter. But what that does let you then explore is mechanistically, what kind of position velocity filters and how do you trade them off do you need to do efficient prediction? So it's absolutely a good um, direction. They're not completely the same problem. So there are some caveats there, but it does tell you, um, this is what I should say this far back in time about velocity and about, about position. So to maybe stay with the, the topic, the Euler Lab account is asking, uh, so I think it's probably Thomas, is asking, the, so if, if optimal prediction is already calculated in the retina, is that simply projected to higher visual areas? And, and how does it interact with recurrence in, um, in higher oh, they, yeah, areas? Yes, so that's, that's a fantastic question um, that I would say we're um, still trying to tease apart. I will say that the, um, Okay, obvious thing, we know that we don't get an independent visual channel. So anything we're gonna extract about the visual world has to come through the retina, but the retinal computation for prediction isn't the end. This is only a short time scale prediction. What we're saying is that it's reformatted the information so that you can easily read out prediction on the kind of 100 millisecond time scale. Of course, 
nervous systems and brains want to make predictions at lots of different time scales. And so while the information is there in the retina, the retina hasn't finished the job of repackaging it so you can do linear readout and linear, you know, sort of the thing we'd say, the computation is done. So we think that downstream recurrence is really important for stretching that um, representation of the future out further in time. And while we think that the retina might be very important for short time scale prediction, say something you're sending to the colliculus so you can do a fast, fast behavior, maybe a reorienting behavior, um, there's lots left to do. And we do think that that's the job of recurrent circuits in the higher visual areas. Thanks. So um, two more questions that I have here. One is a bit more technical. It's about the LNP model that you used to fit the, or well, that didn't work in fitting the, the salamander right. uh, data, but did that work for some of the stimuli in the rat retina? So for the rat retina, you see similar failures of the LNP model um, that you fit to say a checkerboard, a typical checkerboard stim. So you start with a receptive field from your checkerboard and you fit your um, linear filter and your nonlinearity there. If you allow yourself to have enough data to fit an LN model that's going to be a little bit different, um, just let me, let, me, let me play this out a little bit. So if I give you enough of this bar movie so that now you fit your LN model directly to the bar movie where your linear filter, now you have to do a little bit of ridge regression. You have to decorrelate because this has correlations in it. And that's, you know, you have to X out some of the correlations in your filter. Um, but then if you give yourself um, a position velocity filter that you learn from the response of the retina to that bar movie, you can do better. So there's already a little, a little improvement there that you can get just by, um, acknowledging that the retina's L is not static. And what we'd like to be able to do is to make a model that fits all these scenarios well. So fits like your checkerboard flash response stuff well, and then lets you, we figure out what the adaptation is that comes on that lets you do um, the good uh, modifications to your L for the motion stimuli. So, Yes, that's a great um, question. And um, we have some hints that that actually works and lets you understand. None of this is magic. It's all gonna be adaptation and mixtures of position velocity filters. And if I only have a velocity a position filter, then I'm gonna be hamstrung, but some of it will get me around that. Okay, and uh, uh, that question, by the way, um, I didn't say that, that was by uh, Dennis Huben from Jan Bender's lab in Tübingen. Thank and the you. final question is by uh, Brian Jones. Um, so do you think the rules established by neural evolution are consistent across species? Or um, so to what extent does neural computing adopt convergent algorithms? Um, yeah, this is a great question. I have to say that I, of course, don't know the answer to that. But let me speculate if you, if you don't mind me um, indulging me for a second. So. What we'd really like to do at the end of the day is have a theory that's testable and borne out by data that tells us what the hyperparameters are that are common across species that control nervous system wiring. Of course, your genetic code doesn't code for all the synapses or all the connections in your brain. So we know a lot of it is like meta hyperparameters. It control, you know, genetic code controls learning rates and axon guidance molecules and your panoply of um, uh, channels and things like that. And might, might, might start to set up some spatial organization, but then nervous systems sort of take it from there. So that, so from that kind of self-organizing system, it's, it's a little hard theoretically to connect those dots, but that's the way that you would then be able, but once you're able to do that, then you could ask, does, does this lineage do it the same as this lineage? What's encouraging about it is that we find again and again, that there are the same sort of latent uh, genetic molecular features that get used and reused in different lineages again and again, even from sort of single cell organisms to um, vertebrates. 
um, there are motifs um, that come up again and again. So we think that some of the flexibility will be conserved, but of course, if you compare an insect brain to a vertebrate brain, insects are gonna be, for the most part, hardwired where a vertebrate might have some you know, activity dependent plasticity during development that um, lets it sort of flexibly adapt to say new inputs um, and, and new say photoreceptors. So we hope that there's a lever there that we hope that there's an inroad we can make but we don't expect it to be that we'll find like the one grand solution that explains uh, everything across species. But finding a problem where there is no sort of hard limit on how many neurons you need to do a good computation like color vision. Color vision can work in a very simple animal and be just as good from a signal wavelength detection kind of point of view as in a primate. So there we think commonalities will be easier to find. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot for the, for the discussion, even if it's just reading out questions. Um, Thanks a lot for uh, being here this uh, morning for you, afternoon for us, um, and uh, for the for the inspiring talk and all the all the topics that you that you touched on. Um, so, when in which workshop is your talk next week? Um, I the, the next week there are two workshops I'm speaking in at the Bernstein Conference, and um, I should get the titles, but I think they're look upable. There's one on evolution and there's one on um, how uh, coordinated activity across, uh, you know, populations of neurons. Okay. We are also hosting a workshop if you're interested in neurons as cells. So to remind everybody that there's a cellular program going on <laughs> right. on the mechanistic level as well. Yeah, um, we often forget that, but it's very important. <laughs> so um, we will dive deeper into these things next Tuesday. All right. So. Yeah, I would encourage everybody who's um, available to go check out the Bernstein conference uh, next week. It's wonderful that it's happening and it's um, great that it's happening online so so many people can enjoy it. Cool.